Good morning, everyone. You're running a little late today. Uh, it just uh, it started raining out and I installed a bunch of new cutters yesterday. So I was running around outside um, with actually the only umbrella I could find was my wife's cheetah print umbrella. So I was running around there like outside, you know, half in my pajamas with a cheetah print umbrella, checking all our gutters to make sure that they were working. So uh, it's just that, I don't know. It's one of those things like you don't, kind of don't ever see yourself doing that in the future. Like, oh, it's raining. Let's go check the gutters. It's just, it's, I don't know. Is that part of just being an adult or something? You get excited because you get to you get to see how everything's functioning. <laughs> so that's what I was doing. That's why we're we're running a little bit late today. Uh, but regardless, the last couple of days we've been talking about, uh, we've been talking, we've been in First John. We did chapter two, we did chapter three, and just the, the variety of different ways that John is actually teaching to recognize somebody who is not in Christ. Um, this is interesting. We've talked about this, but this is interesting uh, comparing it to what we have in Romans chapter 10, where Paul says, don't say in your heart who will ascend and who will descend. Don't do that. Um, the way that I view that, because the book of 1 John is essentially written to, uh, to tell the difference between a child of God and a child of the devil, the difference between light and darkness, that whole kind of thing. So how do, how do we harmonize those? Paul's saying, is he, is he saying don't do it? And then John wrote a book on how to do it. Well, I think the fact of the matter is in, in Romans chapter 10, Paul is saying don't be judgmental about it. Don't be saying, you know, going around pointing your fingers at people and saying, well, that person's going to hell, that person's not. You know, that's that's not our position. Uh, but as far as being able to tell when somebody has the spirit and when they don't, well, that's actually really important, especially when it comes to teachers. And that's what was going on in the first century when you had the Gnostic teachings happening in whichever church or church ed that John wrote this letter to. And he was he was making a point in each one of his compares and contrasts that he does is this is what a child of God looks like and this is what the spirit of the Antichrist looks like. He has a, a, a variety of labels for this unbeliever. It'll be an unbeliever, spirit of the Antichrist, child of the devil, things like that. And he's contrasting them. This is the authentic, this is the counterfeit. So that being the theme, when we move into chapter four, he's still doing that. Um, so, and this is one of the biggest things. This is probably like, you know, he's talked about how anyone who's hateful is not God's child. Um, anyone who denies the son is not God's child. Um, but then he comes into this and this is really kind of a, um, kind of, kind of just a, the Gnostic idea of Jesus not being physical, um, that he was a spiritual phantasm. Um, John's pretty much going to directly address this starting in chapter four. So he starts and he says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Uh, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, whom you have heard is coming and now even already is in the world. So the Gnostics, their whole big thing was Jesus was not physical. Um, they viewed physical, the flesh. Uh, they said, it's, it's actually kind of interesting, but they said that your, the physical body was sinful. Um, and it, it was sinful flesh, essentially. But the spirit of a person was not. Uh, the spirit of the person was, was holy, righteous, blameless, perfect, all those things. Um, but not because of Jesus. It wasn't because they were sanctified by his blood. Um, they were like that already. So Jesus never, in Gnosticism, Jesus doesn't die on the cross, for example, because um, that wasn't necessary. Uh, sin is only something, according to the Gnostics, that exists in the physical realm, um, but spiritual is all that matters. So you can, um, you could, you're technically without sin and they would claim that. And that's why you have that in the first uh, chapter of John. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Um, so you have, you have that, but that, that was, they had a really warped view of sin. And because of their warped view of sin, they tried to basically retrofit Jesus into it. And the, the decision was made that he could not have been flesh. He could have not have been human because if he was human, he would have been sinful. Um, so it, one of the many things here, but you know, John's calling him out and he's saying anyone who does not acknowledge that Jesus Christ was flesh, that he came in the flesh, uh, does not have this, is not from God. They're not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, actually, denying the incarnation, a uh, big red flag that this person is not from God. The spirit is not from God. Um, so he comes down here and he says, uh, you dear children are from God, uh, believers who are reading this, and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The one who is within us is the Holy Spirit and the one who is within the world is the spirit of the Antichrist. Um, literally everything opposed to the Holy Spirit. He says they, speaking of these Gnostics, these teachers, are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. 
We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth versus the spirit of falsehood. When he says this thing a few verses back here, and he says they are from the world, they speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. Other translations, like word-for-word ones, for an example, like New American Standard, will actually say the flesh here. They'll say they are from the flesh, they speak from the viewpoint of the flesh, um, which I, I kind of like that a little bit better. It's really the same thing, because the flesh, sarks kind of stands in for that worldly system a lot of the times in Scripture. It doesn't mean physical body. It, it means ex- kind of like how the NIV rendered it here, the viewpoint of the world. Um, the world listens to them. We have a different language almost, us who have the spirit. We have, we, we um, as 1 Corinthians says, we explain spiritual realities using spirit-taught words. But the person without the spirit doesn't listen. They, they think we're fools um, when we talk about things from the spirit because they can't understand them. These things are only discerned through the spirit. They're in the flesh. They speak from the viewpoint of the flesh. So you have very conflicting uh, schools of thought there between flesh and spirit. Um, but this idea of the non-physical Jesus and all the other things Gnostics were teaching, they're an antichrist message, first of all, and they're from the flesh. I mean, this is the viewpoint of the flesh. This might make sense in a fleshly mindset, um, but it, of course, does not when it comes to somebody of the spirit. So uh, all that being said, um, th- this really becomes... If, you know, if we're going to use the, the term false teacher, which of course gets thrown around really haphazardly, um, but if, if we're going to use that, uh, we wouldn't really want to stick with what scripture says a false teacher actually is. And I know it's, and then I've, I, by the first, first of all, I'm like captain of um, being guilty with this, but it's, um, it's really easy to, to kind of have those thoughts when we hear somebody butchering the gospel. Um, even if it's something that's just like the really commonplace, uh, you know, they're, they're teaching you that if you sin, you fall out of fellowship with God and you got to try to, you know, climb back up that mountain, confess all your sins. Maybe God will, will forgive you. And then, um, you'll be back in with him for five seconds until you have some kind of a thought and then you're right out. Um, you know, it's, it's really easy to hear that and just be like, okay, well, that's just a false teaching. It's, you know, it's false teacher, false teaching, but really What we have in scripture is false teacher, false teaching, false prophet, um, any way that this is worded, is actually somebody who denies that Jesus is the Son of God, somebody who denies that Jesus came in the flesh. It's a denial of Christ. That's the way that John presents this. And, and, And I guess my question would be, does that take other forms though? And it's, and if it does, it's not listed in scripture. So that's, that's where we get. Well, and that, I guess it kind of is a little bit in Galatians. But for an example, like, does that take other forms? If I'm teaching you that sin is still a barrier between yourself and God, and, and you know, that's, a, that's an active problem, and you've got to manage your sin because God's mad at you, and you have to put on the high priest hat, you have to be your own advocate, you have to go before the Father and atone for your sins, just the standard um, doctrine that gets, that gets taught from the pulpit at our churches. If I'm teaching that, is that somehow a backwards denial of the cross, a backwards denial of Jesus. Because he, of course, secured all that once for all time. And that's what scripture teaches. Um, but if I'm teaching an anti-Christ message, because it, it really would be that, wouldn't it? Um, this doesn't factor Jesus in at all. He's of absolutely no value in, in, a, in a teaching like that, you know, where it's all about sin, it's all about you, it's all about your works, it's all about your performance. Uh, Christ is of no value. Or kind of when that, when that phrase is used is in the book of Galatians and they're teaching the law. And uh, Paul is saying that with law-based teachings, Christ is of no value. Uh, he's of absolutely no value uh, here. So, so I guess that would be my question. I mean, are there other ways to do this? Um, is, is, is that, does that become a backwards denial of the son and thus it's actually a false teaching? Does it actually uh, categorize that? Or is it just a blind guide? Because that's like the, the I guess, the more polite term that I'll use. Um, I don't know if it's polite. It's, it, I guess the, the person who I'm referring to that would probably be really offended by it. But um, what I mean by that is when we see things like, you know, last week, was it last week or the week before we read some teachings by John MacArthur and by Paul Washer? And, then, and it seems from what we read, that they really don't have a great understanding of the gospel. Um, so, but are they false teachers? Well, no. I mean, they're teaching Jesus is the son of God. They're not denying the Jesus came in the flesh. They're not denying the son. They're not, they're not doing that. Um, they just seem to be very, very confused. They seem very, very confused. They've mixed in all kinds of things that you're not supposed to mix in with the gospel. And we've gotten this Frankenstein and that's, and that's what they teach. Uh, this, this mashup between the old covenant and the new covenant. So that 
yeah, I kind of look at that and I say, that's more or less the blind leading the blind. And I don't mean that to be rude. That's something Jesus says in, in the Gospels. But that that's kind of how I look at that. I'm like, so I don't know if, you know, I don't think he's a false teacher necessarily. Um, but, but you know, blind leading the blind, blind guide is, is a way to put that. At least for me. Um, I would stop short of false teacher because I don't think that he qualifies for that. Um, Unless, like I was saying, I'm throwing that out there, unless there's backwards ways to do that. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're trying to get more forgiveness, if you're trying to become more holy, if you're trying to do the things, if, you're, if you are trying to, um, how, how do I put this? If you're trying to complete the finished work of Christ, some, something like that. If you're trying to do that, is that in fact a denial of the sun somehow, or are you just are you just confused? And I, I really lean toward the just confused. I'd really just say that you're just confused. I don't really think it's it's that, but I could see that. Um, here's what it isn't though. When it comes to false false teachings, it's not something we disagree with. Um, it's never that. Um, it just we get just get to say that you know because a, a teacher's out there saying something we don't we don't agree with. Um, you know it's their interpretation. Let's here's a popular one: Romans chapter seven. That's kind of like the crux of all. Of all, you know, you, you can kind of weigh, if you hear somebody speak on Romans 7, you pretty much know everything they're about. So, uh, you know, Romans 7. So somebody, let's say we hear a teacher, you know, teach Romans 7 the classic way. Oh, you're a sinner with a sinful nature and you got to fight off the sinful flesh and you really want to do good, but you can't because you're a slave to sin and all the ways that Romans 7 gets taught, okay? Um, you know, we disagree with that, right? And we, we disagree with that. We look at all of Romans and see a much bigger picture there. It's a much weightier teaching than that. But um, I would stop short again as saying that's, you know, is, is, is their version of that a false teaching? No, it's an incorrect one. Um, it's not going to be helpful. Uh, it's, it's, it's not. It's not going to be helpful. It's not, it's not going to edify. It's going to um, smother, if anything. It's going to enslave, false, false enslavement, because we're not slaves to sin. It's going gonna, it's gonna to do all kinds of bad things. That's why when I look at that, I say that's the blind leading the blind. Um, I don't mean anything bad by that, but that's really, that's the, anyway, that, those are my thoughts on that. You know, is it, is it a false teaching? Um, it, it, no, just cause I disagree with it. It doesn't make it false. Uh, you know, that actually really puts, if, if we, if we were to, you know, cause that's, I mean, I mean, I'm sure you guys have been called false, false something, you know, anytime you start talking about the gospel, you're going to be called false something. Um, but, but th there's a lot of arrogance that goes behind that statement. That's why I think you should, if, if it's incorrectly used, because, if we are going around and pointing out things we disagree with and saying those are all false teachings, what are we saying about ourselves then? Uh, it, it, you know, it's like, well, that's false, that's false, this person's false, that person's false. We're, we're like putting ourselves on a pedestal and saying we're correct. We're the, you know, we're the true. Um, we're the authentic ones over here and everybody else that is not like us is is false. And I think that's why... Um, that's why, you know, I'd, I'd caution against the haphazard uses of that and just stick with what, with what scripture says. This is false. You know, denying Jesus is false. Um, uh, denying Jeremiah's viewpoints or, you know, Jeremiah's, uh, I don't know, well, you know, denying, denying something I said is not or something I believe is not false. It's a different a difference of opinion. So, but yeah, I'm sure, like I said, you know, if you guys are going around talking about the gospel, which I know you are, um, if you're doing that, then yeah, it's, it's, if it hasn't happened yet, it's going to happen. Um, all the, you know, the name calling always, always starts up and you better be, you know, because religion, it's all fear-based. A lot of it's fear-based. Fear, guilt, shame is, is, you know, the three motivators of religion, but, um, fear really taking the center stage there. And, um, they, they kind of want... They're, they're so, you know, and I remember this because, you know, being a part of it for so long, but it's like you're, you're so insecure in your own faith when you're, when you're in a religious system. You're so insecure in your relationship with God, your, your relationship with your father. You know, you're, you're so insecure in that. And it's like offensive when somebody comes along and they're, they're super secure in it. And it's all about Jesus. And they're so happy um, about that. And they can't wait to tell everybody how Jesus forgave them once for all time and how they've been made um, holy through the, the, his single offering, how they're righteous. There's, they're everything justified, glorified, all of that. When somebody comes along and says that it's like super offensive uh, to that person who's, who's, really insecure in their relationship uh, with God. They, you know, they don't know where they stand all the time. They hope they haven't sinned too much that he's become angry with them. And, and they, they see, you know, us and we seem, we, it almost seems like foolishness probably. They, they're, they don't know the scriptures. They don't know the scriptures say those things. Or if they do know them, they've interpreted it differently. 
So they have us coming along and, 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 and repeating all these things the New Testament says, and it's, 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 it's offensive. Um, it becomes extra offensive when we start telling them that they're not being blessed for their obedience. Um, that, that is just, uh, if you really want to uh, heap burning holes over their head, tell them that. Um, you're not meriting anything. Uh, there's no, you're not, if you're not going to be greeted in heaven with some kind of a red carpet ceremony where uh, you're going to have crowns put on your head and all that, it's not, that's not in scripture. Uh, that's in church. It's not in scripture. Um, you're not, you're not doing anything. You are those who did not work. You received a free gift. Um, that is extremely offensive, all of that. Um, so I think because of, of the level of offense that that's often met with, immediately you're gonna, they're, they're going to lash out. They're going to call you false. That's wrong. Um, that's false. Um, my church doesn't teach that. My pastor doesn't teach that. My family has never believed that. Um, they, you look at the history of Christianity. People have never believed that. Uh, so you're coming along with this strange teaching and you're telling us that everything is 100% done, um, that you can rest in Christ and not, you know, it's going to be offensive. It absolutely is going to be. So the, hence the name calling. Um, I, you know, I don't get a lot of terrible comments uh, from time to time. I do. I did when we did the um, couple of, of big ones that I've done that, that have really uh, caused a lot of, of, of negative feedback. Um, when we did all those videos on how women could be pastors, elders, deacons, whatever other title there might be. Um, when we did those videos, that got a ton of bad feedback. And um, recently, when we did the videos on John MacArthur and, and Paul Washer, that got a bunch of bad feedback too, because um, there's people that are followers of them, and you know they 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 were not happy that we were um, challenging these men. You know they weren't happy about that, and it's just it's just fear. Again, it's it's just fear. It's it's a matter of they've followed this person, they've listened to this person. I think a lot of what they believe might spin around this person, and now here we come and saying, now let's take a second look. Let's run this person through scripture, and they're they're not passing the test when we do that. They're not passing. We're, we're not being able to find the things that they're teaching in the New Testament. And I think that's frightening. And I think that's what's causing that lashing out. And now they're mad at me because I just made them see something that they didn't want to see. Um, I just I just exposed that to them. And now they're mad at me because uh, now they're really, they might actually truly be mad at the teacher or mad at the teaching or something like that. But the, but how dare I show, you know, point it out to them, you know, so, so um, we're, I'm going to end up absorbing that the first, the kind of the first reaction that they have to it. So all that being said, you know, talking about false teachers, there's a lot of reasons that um, people call us that. Um, but in, in any event, we have to stick with what scripture says. And a false teacher, false prophet, false whatever, um, antichrist, according to scripture, is somebody who denies Christ. And it has to be that. Um, if it's not, if they're not doing that, then they're not a false teacher. So going down here, here in uh, verse seven, he says, uh, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Um, NIV says atoning there, but it's really propitiation is, is the proper word. Um, but so, right, so John, in the last couple of verses here, he's talking about, okay, anyone who denies Jesus is not, a, not does not know God. You know, this is, this is not somebody who has the spirit. But then when he goes down a little bit, he starts going right back into the love. John reinforces this all throughout his gospel and all throughout this epistle. Love is the native language of the child of God. So if you're not, if you're, if, if somebody is not speaking love or, you know, you, you don't see that, or well, see, but you know, when, when we have the Holy Spirit within us, uh, living within us, um, God is love. God lives within us. Love flows from the inside out. Um, God's love is the uh, epistle to the Romans says has been poured out in our hearts uh, through the Holy Spirit. So, so love is our default setting. Love is our native language. And John keeps bringing us back to that and saying, look, if you're not seeing that, um, there's a pretty good indication that this person doesn't know God. God himself is love. Um, and if they're not if you're not seeing that from them, in fact, if you're seeing hatred from them, the, the opposite of love, it's, it's a pretty good indication that this person is not in Christ. Uh, so he keeps, he keeps circling back to that. He brings other things up and he goes right back to love. Um, love being really, that, that's, that's, the, that's if you're going to look for anything, look for that um, in, within a person. So uh, he goes down here and he says, this is how God showed his love, demonstrated is how some other versions uh, will say this. Um, he showed that he loved by sending his son so that we might live through him. Uh, it's, it's interesting because what you have in other portions of the New Testament, um, you know, he sent Jesus so we might live through Christ. Um, Christ is our life. 
What you have in other portions of the New Testament is when it talks about the state of humanity before the coming of the Son of God, um, death, everyone was dead. Um, there wasn't anyone alive at all. Uh, not in spiritual terms. There was physical life, but that doesn't matter. But as far as spiritual life, there was absolutely none. Um, the world, it's, it's so interesting. There's a parallel here, okay? Uh, at least I've, I, there's a parallel according to me, at least, because I've, I've noticed this. Tell me if this makes sense. Um, you, you have, we all know the beginning of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay? So what you have in the very beginning of Genesis is you have, here's earth, and there's not a single thing alive down there. It's dead, it's dark, nothing. Um, it's formless, actually. The planet even doesn't even have any form. Um, there's nothing there. It's completely desolate. But then you have God coming into this, and he says, let there be light. Um, that's the first thing that he does. He turns the lights on, essentially. Um, and everything that follows that is God breathing life into this dead, dark thing. But what you have in the New Testament is actually something very similar to that. First of all, it, be, it starts with the same three words in the beginning. Um, was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Um, so you, you have... Almost a parallel, but you have the Son of God coming into the world. The true light who gives life to everyone is coming into the world, um, John says. Um, so he is the light from the beginning. He comes into the world, but then you look at this, the state, um, the status of the world, according to Paul. Um, you know, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were that dark, dead thing from the beginning um, that life is breathed into. Um, so you, you have a parallel there. Um, you, have, you have in the beginning, you have God breathing life into earth. Bringing, up, bringing physical life about. But in the New Testament, you have Jesus coming with life in himself. Um, in him was life, and that life is the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness hasn't overcome it. You have that happening again, only it's on a spiritual setting. Um, so it's it just, it just interesting uh, to me. Um, you know, God's testifying to that. He's saying this is how... Um, this is how we know God loves us is because he sent his son uh, to rescue us from this darkness and bring us into the kingdom of light. So it's, it's just cool. It's, it's just cool. And it's, he's testifying to that. He's testifying to his love of the world through us even uh, because the children of God are here now. Uh, we're the first fruits of a new creation. And you have God. We are walking testaments uh, that God loves the world, that God so loved the world. We're walking testaments of that uh, because we're we're saved. Um, you know, we have been saved. We've been made new. Um so anyway, I think it's cool. I think it's cool. And, and John's kind of pointing that a little bit there and he's saying, look, we're testaments here, you know, essentially like we're testaments. Jesus came. He's a testament. Um, God is showing us over and over and over that he loves us. God is love. So when he says, if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Um, last line here of verse 12, God's love is made complete in us. Um, so it's just, it's just, it's, I don't know, it's, we have the fullness, you know, it's not, it's not a matter of, you know, the more that we love, the more love God gives us or something like that. It's God's love is complete in us. It's complete. Um, he gave us everything. That's what's so cool about the new covenant versus the old covenant. And the old covenant is purposely designed this way. It's purposely designed to do this and get that. That's how the old covenant's designed. Do this and God will do that. Um, the new covenant's not like that in any way, shape, or form. It's God stepped into a dark, dead world, sent his son who did everything, who provided everything, um, one needs to look to him and believe. Um, God has given you every single blessing in Christ. He's gone all in on you. He's given you all his love, the completeness, the fullness of his love he's given you in Christ. Um, it's, not, it's not like that. It's not that old system of, of do this and then you also can go backwards on it. Uh, it's, it's not that at all. So just much better promises. Uh, going down here, um, Verse 13, John says, uh, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. Um, and we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Um, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they live in God. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. Um, so, so that kind of that verse right there, um, you know, he's saying, so there's actually three different things in this chapter that he's saying, and this is how you know that a child, a child of God versus the child of the devil. First one is anyone who says Jesus hasn't come in the flesh is not, is not from God. Uh, that's essential. So if somebody's saying that this is not the case, then they're not from God. The next thing is if they don't love, and he's already said that a couple different times throughout this book, but he's saying it again. I and mean, if there's no love coming from them, they're not from God. God himself is love. 
Uh, third thing is verse 13 here. He says, um, this is how we know that we live in him is because we have his spirit. Um, and that the Holy Spirit is not a, um, a quiet entrance, I don't, I don't think, into somebody's heart. It's not, not, not really a quiet entrance in the sense that, oh, I, I, you, know, I, you, do, you don't notice what I mean by that. Um, you do notice everything about you starts to change. Not, it's not but like, you know, poof overnight, not for, not for everybody. Some people are like that. Uh, not really necessarily for everybody. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind, but, but we notice that transformation. We notice that difference. We notice our actions and our attitudes being changed. We notice God's love being expressed through us. Um, and John's saying, he's pointing to that and he's saying, and that's how you know. Um, you know, that's how we know that he, we live in him and he in us. He's given us his spirit. Um, and he's talking to believers and he's saying, and you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, he's saying it without saying it. You know exactly what I mean by that. Um, you know because you have his spirit and you know you have his spirit. And then he goes down here and, and just says, and we have seen and we testify that the father has sent the son to be the savior of the world. Um, John had seen because John walked with Jesus. We more or less haven't seen, um, but we do testify and we do believe and we do testify um, that, that God has sent his son to be the savior of the world. We do that all the time. Now, whether it's it's us actually saying it or coming out and we're saying this or um, it's just the way that we're living, the way that we're loving, um, we are walking testaments that God has sent his son because we're the end product of that. We're the, we're the final result of that. God sent his son into the world and now we have the children of God who have been born of his spirit. All things that, that happened through the finished work of the son of God. So he says down here um, in verse 16, he says, and so we know and we rely on the love that God has for us. Um, we know and we rely on. These are words of confidence. These are confident statements. Um, not we really hope that um, that God's going to let us slide by. You know, we really we really hope we're going to just make it in. We really hope that he's not mad at us. John's saying we know and we rely on the love that God has for us. Um, we know that he loves us. We know because of everything he just said, he's given us his spirit. He sent his son uh, on our behalf. Um, we know all that and we can completely rely on the love God has for us. He loves us. He's testified to this. He's proved that to us uh, time and time again. Very, very similar to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, very similar to how in First Peter, uh, Peter says, um, set your hope completely on the grace that's to be revealed to you um, in Jesus Christ. Set your hope completely on grace. Um, we, we have absolutes like that. Here we're saying, um, John's saying, completely rely on the love of God. Um, <coughs> I think I might be coming down with something. So that's been happening the last couple of days. Um, but regardless, John's saying, completely rely on the love of God. And Peter later on says, set your hope completely on grace. Um, God's not going to let you down here. He's not going to let you down. Look at all the different ways he's testified to this. So it's, it's similar wording. These could almost be... Um, they could almost be teamed up. Maybe they should be. And it might make a good Facebook post to put these kind of side by side. So he goes down here again, and this is the second time he's going to say this. So he's already said up here at the top, um, uh, verse 8, he said God is love. And he's actually going to say it again at the end of verse 16. He says, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Um, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Um, love is made complete. We have confidence on the day of judgment because we already are like Jesus. Uh, so interesting, so interesting to me that this verse somehow gets missed. Um, in this world, we are like Jesus. Now, what did Jesus himself did? He said something similar to this in John uh, 17, uh, one of the most beautiful passages in the entire New Testament. Uh, Jesus says something very similar to this, and maybe John's echoing back to that. Uh, but Jesus says, talking about us, the children of God. Well, he's really specifically talking about the disciples, but this would be anyone who's in Christ. Um, he says, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Um, they're not. Uh, we're not of the world just as he is not of the world. In this world, we are like him. We're in the world, but we're not of it. And that's how Jesus was. We're like him. We're sanctified. We're set apart. We're in Christ. We're in the Son who's in the Father. Um, in this world, we are like Jesus. This is an absolute statement. Um, it's not a... In this world, try to be like Jesus. In this world, do your best to emulate Jesus. What would Jesus do? The, we, I used to have a bracelet that um, said WWJD on it. Um, that's actually wrong. It's not really what would Jesus do. It's in this world, you are like Jesus. Um, you have been made like the Son of God. You are a son or a daughter of God. Um, Jesus himself says, and this, this is another thing that I'm like, how, how do we not talk about this more? Uh, Jesus himself says, um, well, actually Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says this, but Jesus says it a little bit afterwards, but... Um, author of Hebrews says in chapter two, both he who sanctifies, that's Jesus Christ, 
and those who are sanctified, that's us, are from one father. And for that reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. And he says, I will declare your name among my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. The son of God says that. Um, the point of the matter being, it's beautiful scripture because Jesus is our older brother. He's our, our older sibling, essentially. We're younger siblings, but we have the same dad. Um, and that actually adds a lot of weight to scripture like this. It says, in this world, we are like Jesus. Well, yeah, we have the same father. We're from the same family. He's not ashamed of us. He's calling us his brothers and sisters. Um, and likewise, um, we call him our brother. We call him our savior. We call him our Lord. We're not ashamed of him. It goes both ways. Um, he's, he's delighted to, to, um, to, call us, to call us his siblings. So we are like him. We are like him. We're of the same family. We're of the same father. We are like him. Um, we have the same spirit. We have the Holy Spirit within us, the same Holy Spirit that resided within Jesus, the same Spirit that raised him from the dead um, lives within us. Uh, we are like him. We are like our family. You know, that's that's something, you know, when we look at uh, the new covenant, or I, I guess we could put it this way, but when we look at salvation, all of that, as being born again, we're, we're in God's family now. Um, actually, not positionally, oh, well, eventually, sure. No, actually, um, we died to Adam. We're not part of Adam's family anymore. We died. We were buried. We were raised a new creation. We have been born again. We're a new person. Uh, the old person that was born into Adam died. We will never see that person again. Um, we are born in um, of God's spirit. We are of God now. Um, when we look at it that way, um, it just, it, I don't know. You know, all, all that being said, we're, we're, like, we're like Jesus. We're like our family. And when, when we understand it, I think that way, uh, family-wise, um, it, it makes more sense uh, because we're like our we're like our earthly families, aren't we? A little bit, um, maybe maybe you know, be that good or bad, right? You know, we're, so, sometimes that's a good thing if, if we're like if we're like our parents or we're like our siblings. You know, sometimes that's good, sometimes it's bad. But I think it's something that's understandable uh, for for people. Uh, and I, I know it's understandable for me. A family dynamic is understandable because we all have families, whether we. Um, enjoy that or not, we all have them, and um, in some ways we are like them. And but but that but those are imperfect human families. So you're going to get a lot of negative versions of that too. Um, but what if we had a perfect spiritual family that we know have been born into, and we are like them? Um, that that makes a little bit more sense. What if we are like God because He's our actual Father? What if we are like Him because we're like our Dad? Um, what if we are like Jesus because He's our actual brother, um, and we are like Him? Uh, because of that, we're born of the same father. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're very, very similar. Um, actually, according to John, we're identical. Um, in this world, we are like him. So, um, we all, we all, we, anyway. I think, I think that the family dynamic gets missed in in the in the new covenant. I really think it does, and I think it's it's that's that's really too bad um, because I I think I think this could this is just an opinion. You know, just kind of observing. Let's look, millennials, sure, but let's look at Generation Z because they're kind of the spotlight now, okay? They're really a pretty fatherless generation, aren't they? Um, it, it really, I think this might be the most, as far as family dynamics go, as far as uh, parental dynamics, they're, they've really been let down, I think, more, maybe more so than most generations have, and I don't know. I mean, I'm not a wizard with human history. There's probably been worse examples of this, but... I, I think so. I, I kind of look at them and I'm like, they were raised by the millennials. The millennials were had all their issues. Um, and now you have this other generation that really hasn't had good examples largely, by and large, doesn't mean that's all their cases. But I, you know, interacting with them when I was a, um, when I was a manager for a while, I employed uh, many, many, many Generation Z, uh, many, many uh, people from that generation. And it was really that. It was pretty much everybody. Honestly, I think almost, if, if not Pretty much everybody, almost all of them, had some kind of a broken home. They they had some kind of a, a distant relationship with either one or both parents. Um, there there was there was it was just very very common, and you know that that adds to that searching that that, it, that already existed within them because as Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, God put eternity in every human heart. Um, God had hoped people would seek Him, um, but you know all of that you know. That that being said, you know they're they're searching, they're 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 looking for that, and um, religion provides structure. You know, religion provides structure, and it's a deadly, poisonous trap to to fall into. Um, and it, but some people are looking for structure, and they'll they'll unfortunately sometimes they become raw meat to be seduced by religion, by the teachings of men. Uh, but I'll tell you what provides structure is family, 
And there is an open invitation to be born into the family of God. It's, it's out there and it's for everybody. And this is really a big deal. And if we hit on that maybe a little bit more, and we talk about all the things that happen after that, um, God's going to give you his very spirit. You're, you become his heir. You become his heir because you're actually his kid. That's why you became an heir to God. Um, Jesus is, is your brother. Um, you're, you're in. You're in, the, you know, you're in the heavenly family. You have, you have these things now. Um, you know, if, if maybe if we, if we geared it a little bit more that way or we talked about it a little bit more that way, the gospel might be a little bit more attractive uh, to people who have been looking for that, have, have really have never had that, and they've been looking for that. So I don't know, some thoughts. I might, I might do some, some writing in that direction eventually. So, okay. Um, so he goes down here in verse 19 and he says, we love because he first loved us. Um, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Um, whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have not seen, whom they have seen rather, um, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Um, you know, love one another as I have loved you, Jesus says. And John is saying here again, he's, he's, he's bringing love out again. So he kind of ends this uh, with that same, here it is. Um, if somebody is not loving, they are not of God. John's making this really cut and dry. If they don't love, they don't have the spirit. Um, God is love. It's impossible for the child of God not to express that in some way. Uh, so he's, he's saying that here and he's saying, look, and, and, and furthermore, if somebody hates their brother or sister, and, and that really would be generalized, that would kind of be anybody, I think. Um, not necessarily having to be a brother or sister of a person, but really if somebody is hateful, if they hate somebody, they actually hate somebody who they have seen, how could they love God whom they haven't seen? And he's asking, he's throwing this question out there. He's like, doesn't that make sense? Um, so, um, but in verse 19, I like quite a bit too. He says, we love because he first loved us. Um, what I hear a lot, and I think this is an unfortunate uh, misrepresentation of the gospel, uh, is that God comes almost all the way. And first of all, it would really be Jesus. God is sending Jesus, but it would really be Jesus. But, you know, I hear a lot that, oh, God come, God will come like 99% of the way. You just got to come 1% of the way or, you know, some some version of that, whatever the percentile is. God comes 90% of the way. You have to come 10% of the way, whatever. Um, that's not what we see in the New Testament. Uh, God came, if, if or, or by sending his son, 100% of the way. Um, 100% of the way he had to because we were dead. We were talking about that a little earlier. We were dead. We were lost. We were wandering in darkness. Uh, we couldn't see where we were going. Uh, God had to come 100% of the way by sending his son. Uh, he, Jesus came 100% of the way. He did 100% of the work. He had to. Uh, we had nothing to contribute uh, any more than any dead thing can contribute. For an example, paralleling that back up with the creation of the world, did did God come 90% of the way to planet Earth and then Earth did the other 10%? Uh, Earth was dead. There was no life there. There was smothered in darkness and it would have remained that way forever without form, devoid of life. Um, did, so, so did God come down there and say, okay, come on, come on, Earth. Just, just, I'm, I'm all the way here. I just need a little participation. He would have seemed like a lunatic because he's talking to something that's dead. Um, there's, not, there's no life there. So earth doesn't come 10% of the way. Okay, God, you know, I think I'll, I think I'd like to have trees and flowers and things like that. So, okay, no, no, God has to do everything. He has to do absolutely everything there because earth has no ability. You parallel that up with the new creation. Well, the, really the old creation being Adam's children, that's really what it is. They have no ability whatsoever. They're dead, they're dark, they're lost in darkness. Jesus came 100% of the way and provided salvation um, in that case. So and he provides regeneration for that life, actual life. Um, so all, all that, you know, we, we love because he first loved us. God first loved us. That is why we love. Um, and he, uh, so that's the end of the chapter, actually. That's, that's the end of uh, chapter four. So tomorrow we'll end up finishing up first John. And, uh, there's, there's some interesting scripture in chapter five, uh, maybe perhaps the unforgivable sin gets mentioned in chapter five, I believe. So we'll talk about that and parallel that up with the other mentions of this that are in the gospels, the synoptics specifically. And just kind of have a conversation with that and, and, uh, and close it out that way. But a lot in First John. And I think, honestly, we might do Second and Third John because they're, it's like a birthday card. I mean, there's, there's not much text in either one of those, uh, either one of those books. But there's, there's some meat there. I mean, there's, there's definitely things to absorb. So uh, maybe we could do those ones as well. Let me go down and get your comments. I saw there was um, a few of them coming in here. Uh, Manuel, good morning. Manuel says, no shame. Uh, I was saying for anybody who hadn't uh, heard me say this, uh, the reason I was late on getting on today is because it was it's raining out now, and it's um, and I just put new gutters on the house, so I was running around looking at all the gutters, making sure they're 
they're working. Um, and we're, and we're, we're getting there, but I still, I, I notice imperfections in the system. So I got to do more work up there. Um, going down here, uh, Manuel says pointing out self-righteousness comes to mind. Um, yeah, so we were talking about, um, well, self-righteousness might be okay to point out. It just, so like if we see a teacher that's, that's, you know, self-righteousness comes through, I'm, I think, I think this is what the way I, I would think self-righteousness would be. If we look at the scriptures and we see the law and we see that the people of Israel stumbled over the law because they pursued God as if he was obtainable by works, by their own abilities, they tried to become righteous. So I think that that's really what self-righteousness would be. And it doesn't have to be the law of Moses. It can be anything. Um, but by, by our own ability, we're trying to become righteous instead of just accepting the free gift of righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. It's so easy. We can become actually righteous, 100% righteous. Um, but that's, again, that's a stumbling block. Pride doesn't like that. Um, so so that's, that's how I, I'm, me at least, interpret self-righteousness. So if, if we see that, and that's easy to almost spot. Uh, when we talk about heavenly rewards and we start saying that you do all these things and God's going to lavish all these, these different, you know, you're going to have a really big house, first of all. Um, the people who didn't do anything are going to live in a trailer. You know, how, you know these really ignorant things that, that kind of get that gets taught and said you're going to have seven crowns. And well, actually, I think there's only five. You're going to get all five of them. Um, that's, you know, some, some people are just going to get one. Uh, and so you're, they're going to have to deal with that for all of eternity. I mean, that's just that's such, such silliness. So I think pointing that out is probably good. Just again, it's just got to be done in that loving way, which is which which gets hard. It gets extra hard when they start getting mad and then they start like lashing out at you. You know that that's when it gets extra hard. So I I know, but yes, pointing out self righteousness. Um, we were talking a little bit about um, teachers that um, you know is is there are such a thing as a backwards denial of Christ? You know they're they're not denying Christ, but they're at the, in the same breath, they're telling you that you are the high priest, you are the advocate, things like that. Is that actually a denial? Is, is it a denial of Christ or is it not? Is it, is it just ignorance? So um, going down here, uh, Manuel says, challenging the norm will ruffle, ruffle their feathers. And that's really true in like everything. Uh, that's just, hum, you know, uh, creatures of habit, humans are. So I, I think that's really true in everything, challenging the norm, um, challenging teachers that they respect um, that, that really, that really will do it. If you start challenging the authority of a teacher that they, that they really respect, you know, that'll, that'll really, um, rile them up sometimes too. And we don't mean to do that. That's not our objective. Like, let's, let's see how many like offensive things we can, you know, fit into, uh, I mean, we're not doing that. It's just, we, we, we just have a very different mindset, I think, than, than a lot of um, somebody who's really in a religious mindset. For an example, we're not followers of people and that's big. That, that's really big. And that, that is really freeing not to be a follower of a person. So we listen to each other. We talk about Jesus and everything. We do this all the time, but we're not followers um, in the sense that if if one of us started, you know, saying something, even if it's okay, let's say it's not even something wacky. Let's just say it's something different. Here's here's one. I think grace people disagree on this all the time. Did Jesus forgive everyone? Is is he really the propitiation, not just for our sins, but also the sins of the entire world? Is everyone's sins been forgiven? Or is is that actually just those who place their faith? in Christ. It, you know, which, which one is it? Um, is everybody, is everybody forgiven? And that's something grace teachers disagree on. Some people say yes. Some people say, well, they, they can be if they, if they believe in Jesus. Um, you know, but I thought, you know, I've listened to I don't know, follow is probably the wrong word again. I'm just going to say the thing I just said we don't do, but I, I listen to a lot of different grace teachers. I hear different things a lot, some of which I don't agree with. Um, but that's okay. That, that's fine. You know, and they, they hear things I say that they don't agree with. That's fine. We're not followers of one another to where we started like a church of Jeremiah Ryan or a church of whoever the, the teacher is. And okay, well now, now, you know, he said that. So that's what we all believe. And well, we don't do that. We all have our own minds. Uh, we all make our own decisions. Uh, you know, some, some things we hear that we agree with and other things we don't. Um, but that's not how the religious mindset is. The religious mindset is they, they do become followers of people and whatever that person says, they have to believe that. Otherwise, so, so they put a lot of, of um, weight into, into the words of men. And I think what happens is, is when we come along and we challenge somebody like a MacArthur or a washer, somebody that's really well established, and we say, hey, let's run these guys through scripture. Oh my goodness, like we can't find any of these things that they're talking about here. Um, that's, 
there, again, if that happened with us, you know, in the grace community, let's run Jeremiah Ryan through scripture. Okay, well, he's saying that everybody is forgiven. I don't see that in scripture, so he's probably wrong. That really wouldn't rattle us that, you know, we, okay, well, he's, he, he got it wrong. It really wouldn't rattle us because nobody put really any stock into me as, as a person. No one, no one really put any stock in. So, you know, okay, so he's wrong about that. Um, but kind of the religious mindset puts all their, their stock into a teacher, and and when the teacher gets something wrong, it's frightening. And and, and I think that they're gonna they're gonna circle the wagons. I mean, they're gonna protect the teacher, and they're gonna they're gonna do what they do, and they're gonna lash out at you for pointing that out. Um, but they still, it's it, you know, the reason they're mad is because something clicked. You know, so, something clicked. I feel like, and that's that's why they got mad. And they don't like that you pointed that out. They don't like what they just saw there. And um, it's 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 fear. You know, they're, now they're afraid, and now they're afraid. So now they're they're gonna they're gonna lash out. Um, it happens within. Religion, you know, I, I think it, you could find examples of that elsewhere in the world as well. Um, but religion is really a big one with that. Um, that's why I think um, we, we, we talk about this from time to time, but that I think religion really gets its, its, its uh, claws in when it comes to following people. Follow, following men is almost essential. You almost have to have that uh, for religion to take hold is being a follower of a person. Uh, because when you become a follower of a person, Scripture takes the back seat, the Holy Spirit takes a back seat, and now everything comes from the mouth of this human. And that's, I think, where we get led astray so often. Uh, going down here, uh, By Grace New Covenant says, um, um, Hallelujah, amen, I love this. Um, how beautiful, I love this. I, yeah, I'm not sure what we were talking about right then. I think we were talking about, um, we were probably about halfway through uh, the chapter of uh of uh, chapter four here. So it was probably something about God uh, demonstrating his love uh, toward us, um, which by, by sending his son. Uh, um, I think that's what it was actually come, going down to your next comment here because you say, thank, thank you, Jesus Christ, our beloved older brother. Yes, absolutely. Um, and he is, and we're really, he really is. Um, he's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters and we really are part of, a, of, of the family. We're from the same father. It's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful um, reality that we have in Christ. Uh, going down here, uh, Manuel says Generation Z. Yes, that's what, who I was talking about when I was saying they're kind of, in, in my opinion, and just from my interactions with them, they're they're a very fatherless generation. They're a very family-less, if that's a um, a word, uh, generation. They're, they really are, um, and it's it's really really sad, and it it almost like sets the course of their whole life too. Is it's it's it, it you know having experiencing early rejection or at least early strife with their parents, um, it, it sets their whole course. And, and that can be in any generation, but it really just seems like Z has that more so than, than not, has that more so than not. Uh, so that's why I was, when, when we were talking about that, I was saying maybe if we really hit on the family dynamic of the new covenant, that, that might be really attractive to them. And not because we're trying to sell them something, but we want them to know what's out there. You know, we want them to know they can have a family. They can have a father. They can have a father who loves them. And then, t you know, and, and talk about all the things that come from that. And they can have an older brother who's a perfect advocate on their behalf. They can have all these things, um, you know, so. Uh, Manuel says, ego, ego, ego. Yes, <laughs> there's lots of that too. Um, Lots, lots of lots of pride in religion for sure, but okay, guys. Well, thanks so much for uh, for tuning in and sharing your thoughts on First John chapter four. And tomorrow we'll finish it up. We've got chapter five, and I, like I said, I think we'll might as well just do Second uh, John and Third John. There's not much there at all. We could probably do those in one live stream because they're so short. Um, they're they're birthday card epistles. So, but okay, guys. Well, thanks so much, and uh, have a great Wednesday. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.